Hello and welcome from the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, where we've just discovered who has received the 2008 prize for physiology or medicine. With me to discuss the prize is Professor Jan Andersson, member of the Medicine Prize Committee. Professor Andersson, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to us so soon after the announcement's made. Could we begin by you telling us who has received the 2008 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine? So we had three laureates. Harald Sjöhausen received the award because his discovery of human papilloma viruses cause of cervical cancer, while Francois Barré-Sinussi and Luc Montagnier received the award because of the discovery of human immunodeficiency virus. And this, this was a, a prize that was divided between two subject areas, which is unusual for the Medicine Prize and something I'd like to discuss later. But if we sort of turn to each prize, individual prize separately, could we discuss the um, uh, Harold von Hausen, Hausen's discovery of the cervical cancer viruses? Could you tell us more about the discoveries that were involved in this process? So that was a prize given to a hypothesis that was generated and took 10 years to elucidate whether it was right or wrong. And he formed the hypothesis that uh, human papilloma virus consists of a whole family of virus and indeed there were specific types that cause cervical cancer. He proved that to be true and he identified a completely new set of types of papilloma virus then associated with a malignancy that is now contracting at least 500,000 individuals per year globally. And you mentioned at the, at the very beginning of the announcement that this was uh, discoveries that were dogma-breaking. This was something that wasn't generally accepted by the scientific community. Could you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, at the time when he made the hypothesis, the scientific community thought that the cancer was caused by human herpes simplex type 2 virus, a virus that was known to cause genital ulcers, but never have been associated with malignancies in humans, though there were evidence in animal uh, experimental model that that virus actually could cause cancer. And so how did uh, Professor Zorhausen go about breaking this dogma? How did he make people convinced that this virus was indeed involved with cervical cancer? The long journey he had to take was to make new diagnostic methods for being able to detect HPV DNA within the nuclei of the cells. And for that it took a long time and also to realize that there were so many different types. So he had to make so many different types of reactions in order to prove the case. And what were the key breakthroughs? It was his continuously work on clinical samples to have a complete conviction that he was right. When the first five years he never found a single positive sample from any cervical cancer, he still consisted with his belief that there were subtypes of HPV that actually were causing this. And piece by piece he put it all together from cervical uh, genital warts over to, uh, to cervical cancer. And, and how did he do that? He made small pieces of DNA that he used as Velcro bands for fishing for complementary DNA from the clinical samples. And he did it with a technique that is called low stringency hybridization, so that partial binding of the DNA was enough for his fishing experiments. And then he refined the tools all the time until finally came to, to re reagents that worked out for him. And he, so he, he looked for DNA within normal patient cells that, that uh, were originated from human papillomavirus. Yes, and you have to remember that at that time point you could not culture this virus. And also the tumours didn't produce viral particles. In the tumours, the viral genes were incorporated into the host genome. And thus he could only de uh, detect then parts of the virus and those genes that were incorporated in the cancer cells. And there were two particular types of this virus that were the key breakthrough. Could you tell us a bit more about that, please? Yeah, and that tells you a little bit how much he was able to fish out. So he started by discovering the HPV type 1 to 4. Then came the 5 and 6. 11 was the one that caught him on track to detect HPV 16 and 18, which was the two types that was associated with cervical cancer. 70% of all cervical cancer are caused by HPV 16 or 18. And those were the ones he discovered. And 
how did, how did they cause cervical cancer? How did, I mean, human papillomavirus is, is originally known for causing skin warts, but how, how does a uh, virus that causes that sort of disease cause cancer? We were able to demonstrate that in the malignant cells there were two specific sets of viral genes that were overexpressed, E6 and E7. Those make the chromosomes instable so that they can mutate. In addition, they generate uncontrolled growth of these cells so that they can turn into a malignant state. And that was the key experiments to demonstrate how the virus was associated with the, with the cervical cancers. And what sort of a time scale does that involve? I mean, this, this won't be an instant thing of a virus inserting its own DNA into cells and cells suddenly becoming tumorous. What actually happens? So in most individuals, in fact 90% of those that actually get infected, they will spontaneously heal this infection within two years' time. But in some, it becomes a chronic infection. It generates what we call viral latency. No virus is produced, but incorporation instead. And totally something around 0.8% of all infected with the high-risk types are at risk for developing cancer. So what did these discoveries allow us to do? What was understanding that uh, human papillomavirus 16 and 18 would cause the majority of cervical cancers? There are two major effects by that. One is that we now have improved the screening technology. Papa Nicolau smears has been used for more than 40 years. The addition of now screen for high-risk human papilloma types allow you for a much more secure risk evaluation and then advice for medical treatment for those that have the chronic infection with these high-risk types. The other development is that we now have generated vaccines against HPV 16 and 18. They mount neutralizing antibodies to this virus 10 times better than the actual infection. So it's better than nature and it has already been proven that the vaccine protects against acquisition of the virus. However, we will have to wait at least 10 to 15 years before we really are sure that it also will affect um, acquisition of cervical cancer. So with with, um, these discoveries, vaccines have been developed that can hopefully prevent the disease, which is quite quite prevalent worldwide. Could you say something about how prevalent it is, please? I mean, the the cancer occurs in 500,000 individuals per year. In addition, these viruses also cause other type of cancer, cancers of the anus, of the penis, and of tonsils, and those vaccines can have effect there too.